so I'm at Brown University. I also I, I work one day a week at Real Time Robotics, which is a startup company based in Boston that is trying to make motion planning on a chip to automate industrial robotic work cells and make them work safely and collaboratively with people and with other robots. Uh, so this talk is called Towards Complex Language in Partially Observed Environments. It's a really exciting time to be a roboticist because so much is so much progress is being made so quickly. So when I was a postdoc at MIT, I worked as part of this robotic forklift project, which was led by Seth Teller. Um, today, we have autonomous cars being fielded in cities um, around the country, uh, mostly for testing right now, but uh, it's, it's really a whole different world from where it was back then, where we have multiple different companies that are taking this technology to consumers. Um, and you know, we're seeing you know, these, these very large rollouts happening. At Brown, I teach a class where every student gets their own autonomous drone. Um, it's a drone that we built. So it's a Raspberry Pi Python autonomous drone where all the autonomy is on board the drone implemented in Python. So for teaching, that's really nice because we can hand you the drone and your base station machine needs very little on it. It doesn't have to be fast. It doesn't need to be any particular operating system. You can connect to the drone over a web browser. Um, so this enables us to get lots of people um, building our robots and flying. So this is uh, college students at Brown before COVID. Um, this semester, we're planning to mail the drones to the students um, along with soldering kits so that they can do it wherever they happen to be while maintaining isolation. Uh, and we're also doing a rollout right now to high schools uh, throughout Rhode Island. So the, we're making a version of the course for high school students so that they can learn about autonomous robots and autonomous that setting. Now we're also seeing a lot of advances in industrial drones. So for example, the Skydio drone is a commercial platform that uh, was a, built by a company Skydio that was founded by old colleagues of mine at MIT. And this drone has uh, 13 cameras, a stereo pair for each of the six sides of the cube, plus a high resolution color camera that uh, is capable of flying around autonomously in complicated environments, tracking people, and following a person uh, through the environment. So it can follow you as you're mo mountain biking down a mountain, dodging trees and rocks and other obstacles. So as these robots become more powerful and more autonomous, there's a real question of how are we going to interact with them? How are we going to tell them what to do? And how are we going to get them to do things that we want them to do and not do things that we don't want them to do? Existing interfaces to uh, robots really hasn't changed much in, in, uh, in, in a long time. So back when we were doing the forklift project, there was a touch screen interface that you could use to circle objects on the ground you wanted the robot to pick up and circle where the robot should put things. Um, today, if you get into the back seat of a Waymo car, on the back of the seats, you'll see a touch screen interface that you can use to see what the car is doing. You can, you'll see like the pedestrians and stuff that it's detected along with uh, you know, telling it what to do and where to go. Similarly for the Skydio drone, there's a phone app and you install it on your phone and use it to push buttons and tell the drone what to do. So these sorts of interfaces are good when there's a relatively small and fixed set of things that you want the robot to do. Um, but it becomes challenging when the robot be, is more autonomous, it can do a lot of different things and you can't really fit them all in the interface. And additionally, you don't want to train the person, you know, with how to use the interface or what all the things mean. So what my lab is thinking about is how we can enable people to interact with robots the same way they do with other people using natural language. So we'd like to say to the robot, put the metal crate on the truck. And then what the robot has to do is interpret what these words mean. So map between the words metal crate 
and really high dimensional sensor information coming in through its cameras and through its lidars. Um, and this information it has a limited field of view. So you might not even be able to see the metal crate right now. Um, you might have to turn around so that you can point your camera at it. Um, and then figure out what the metal crate is, what the truck is, and then output really high dimensional electrical signals at a really high frame rate that are going to its motors to make the robot do the thing that you told it to do. Um, and that might include, you know, information gathering actions. It might need to turn, you know, make a plan to turn around to find the metal crate. And then once it's found it, pick it up and then go somewhere else to where it thinks the truck might be, find the truck and then pick it up. And I don't know where those things are to be. So this is already a hard problem because of this sort of size mismatch. Um, the human said something really short, but the robot has to interpret it with like really big high dimensional sensor information and produce outputs in terms of really high dimensional actuation commands. So um, it's also challenging because people don't like to stick to a fixed vocabulary and grammar. So here's a video of a fork of a simulated forklift putting a pallet on a truck. So it lifts it up, drives forward a little bit, and then puts it down on the truck. And the video is just looping there. And what we did, and I like to show this video because it is the same annotation interface, we, or the same annotation paradigm, I should say, that we use for all of our research. So what we do is we show people um, on the internet or in, the, in, the real, in real life, we show them examples of the robot doing a thing. And then we say, how would you command an expert human operator to do the action you're seeing here in this video? And then they have to write something down. Uh, usually it's write something down because they're easy to put on Amazon Mechanical Turk. So they say things like, put the tire pallet on the trailer. Um, or they say, place the pallet of tires on the left side of the trailer. So here's somebody gave more specific commands about what the robot should do. Or somebody else said, lift tire pallet, move to unoccupied location on truck, lower tire pallet, reverse to starting location, lower forks, end. Um, and that was a little funny. Um, they, they kind of made up this programming language. They stuck end at the end. Maybe they felt it was more robotic. But if you look at like each of these steps, you know, every single thing that they're describing is happening in the video. They're giving this really granular description of what's going on. And actually, when we do this task, we, we showed a lot of different people this video. And what we see is that we never see the same command twice, even for that really short, seemingly straightforward video clip. Um, we see a tremendous amount of diversity in the ways that people describe what's going on in this video, or they, they would the commands that they write for this for this one video, this one really short video. So the challenge is to try to be diver, uh, robust to all of this diversity and understand what the person's telling us, no matter how they choose to word it and no matter what levels of granularity they, they decide to use. And of course, we don't just want to do that one video. We don't just want to put the metal crate on the truck. We'd also like to understand totally different commands, um, like move backwards 10 feet. Or you might imagine telling a robot in your home, uh, tilt the picture frame a little bit to the left on the wall. Okay, there, stop. Um, giving it really you know, fine-grained feedback on what to do. Or you might want to give really high-level commands. So you might want to say something like, move everything from receiving to storage to the forklift, and then have it go off and run for an hour and then come back and say, okay, the job is done. Or to your household robot, you might want to say, clean up the kitchen and then go off and do some, something else and you come back and your kitchen is clean. Um, you might want to give really um, abstract commands that have the robot going off on its own for a long time. And of course, we don't expect these systems to work all the time. It's really hard to make a robot work at all. And it's even harder to imagine making a robot work um, by understanding natural language input. So if you say, put the metal crate on the truck and the robot gets stuck and doesn't understand something, then it'd be nice if the robot could respond to that in some way, maybe by asking a question. So you could say, the robot could say something like, which truck? And then the person might answer the truck on the left. And then using that information, the robot can recover and go on to do the task that has been asked. 
So fundamentally, the problem that my lab is trying to solve is that people want to talk to robots about everything they can see and everything they can do. And so what that says is that we need, if we want to be able to handle this problem, we need models that capture everything the robot can see and everything the robot can do. So my lab approaches this problem by enabling human robot collaboration by learning decision theoretic models for communication, action, and perception. So the communication bit is about language and gesture and communicating with people. The action is making models of or learning models of everything the robot can do, um, including at different levels of abstraction. And perception is connecting to everything the robot can see. So one of the examples I like to, th I like to th talk about is called the speck of dust problem. So and I could actually like, I li I'd like to be able to say to the robot, robot, there's a speck of dust on the floor over there. Go pick it up and throw it away. Um, so before I said that to the robot, it really better not be paying attention to specks of dust on the ground because most of them are irrelevant and there's way too many objects like that uh, for that to be computationally efficient. But if I give that natural language command, if I tell the robot to, to do that, then all of a sudden the speck of dust better be really important or else it's not going to be able to understand what the person meant and do the right thing. That's showing that perception is really tied up in what's going on. So this is going to enable the robot to scale to very large problems, detect and then recover from failure and improve from experience. So the technical approach that we take is partially observable Markov decision processes or POMDPs. So POMDPs kind of have a bad rep because they're very hard to find uh, solutions for. But robots are really hard, right? So it's maybe it's okay that our model, our POMDP model is hard to solve. I like to say POMDPs are like Python. You know, Python is undecidable in the general case, right? Like the halting problem is a thing. Um, and it turns out POMDPs are as well. But that doesn't stop us from using Python to program our robots. Um, similarly, you know, just because the model is complicated, it shouldn't stop us from using that model if it's the right model uh, to be using, if it captures useful things. Um, so POMDPs actually do capture really useful things for a robot. So a POMDP consists of a sequence of states, and we make an assumption that each state only depends on a single previous state and not all of the rest of the states in the past. That's the Markov assumption. Um, then at each state, we get to observe something in the environment. So if you're a robot, this is your sensors coming in, your cameras and your LIDAR and your inertial measurement unit, your IMU, giving you information about what's in the environment. So you don't get to observe the state. That's what the, the, clear, the not shaded S means. You don't get to observe it, but the shaded means you get to observe the observations. And then based on those observations, you predict what you think the state is. Then you get to take actions. So at each step, you take an action, and depending on what action you take, that's going to change what's happening in the next state. So you can predict where you're going to be in the next state by knowing where you were in the last state and what actions you took in that state. If I decided to drive forward in the last state, then in the next state, I can predict I'm probably more you know, forward than I was in the, in the previous state. Then the last thing we need to make this model complete is a notion of what is good and what is bad. What are good states to be in? So we do this in a really general way by in, in assigning a reward for uh, being in different states. And that's just a number that's assigned to a state to indicate how good or bad it is to be in that state. So the idea of a POMDP is that you have this kind of model and then you have to find a policy which is a mapping of states to actions that says what action is am I supposed to do in each state um, that maximizes my reward and so I have to and I also have to figure out what states I'm in I'm in too so it's like mapping actually belief states to actions 
Um, so this model is really general, but it's the simplest model I know of that captures everything that a robot is. Um, it's got states, it's got observations, it's got actions, and the reward gives it the sense of what a goal is. But now what we want to do is take this really general model that doesn't give us a lot of computational benefits and start to make assumptions about the structure of the model that enable us to do efficient learning and inference. So the first thing, and what I, what I call this model overall, is the human robot collaborative POMDP. Um, and the idea is that this model is this is really aspirational, but like the idea is that this model is the one that's going to let the robot truly collaborate with its human partner. So to get there, we're going to start to change and augment our basic POMDP model. We're going to take the state and factor it into two parts, the physical state of the world and the human's mental state. What does the person want the robot to do? Then we can refactor our reward function to say, well, a reward isn't just anything. It's do what the person wants. You know, I'm, a, I'm supposed to be helping the person. So if I'm a robot, my job is to figure out what the person wants and then, and then do it. Then I can refactor my observation space to say, well, I've got my physical sensors, but then I can imagine that I have a speech recognizer running and that's going to give me in, input from language and a human body tracker running, and that's gonna give me input from their gesture. And then using that information, I can try to predict what their mental state is, and then based on that, take actions. So this problem of observing the language, getting the input from the speech recognition system, and predicting what the human mental state is, is really the problem of language understanding. And then related, I can think about physical actions, but also I can think about language actions. I can think about asking questions and I can think about saying things to the person and predict how those are going to change the person's mental state, with, which might change what they do in future time steps and reason about um, you know, dialogue with the person. And in fact, there's a whole field of POMDP dialogue systems without robots um, that kind of does this. Uh, and that's what I mean by communication for collaboration. Then you can think about actions, especially the physical actions that change the physical world. Um, to really have a robot with a really general action space that can do those really fine-grained actions as well as the really coarse-grained actions, what you need is some kind of way of putting hierarchical abstraction into the the model. Um, and that's really an open research question, taking language out, taking robots out. Um, you know, the right way to put hierarchical abstraction, state abstraction, and action abstraction into these models. Um, and that's what I mean by action for collaboration. And then finally, there's this problem of perception. You know, how do I make a model of the world? How do I perceive the environment, especially in a really highly goal-based way, where I'm not paying attention or wasting computational resources on things that aren't important right now, um, but I am paying close attention to the things that are important. And that's the speck of dust problem. Like if I'm told to pick up a speck of dust, I better care about specks of dust. But if I'm not, then they better not be important. Um, and that's what I mean by perception for collaboration. So I'm gonna give an example of how this plays out in a particular, this was really general so far. So I'm gonna give an example of how this plays out in a particular um, piece of work, but I'm gonna check the Q&A and I see there is one. Can the public get access to my drone kit? Um, yeah, um, so we got a grant from the NSF to get 300 drone kits and they're sitting in my lab. I haven't actually seen them because COVID, um, but they're sitting in my lab right now. Uh, but they made about 350. So the other 50 are on sale right now at the Ducky Town uh, website, duckytown.org. I don't know if I can put it in chat, but I don't really want to put it in chat because the caveat to this is it's really a beta thing right now. Um, and what we're doing uh, with this project is thinking about how to scale it up. 
So the kit as it exists today has about, to build the drone, has about eight hours of soldering um, and putting stuff together uh, to get a drone that flies. And it'll take longer if you don't yet know how to solder and stuff. Um, so, and, you know, it does, you know, if you do it, it, it puts together and flies, it does what we say. Um, but it, we're not a polished product. Um, and we're actually in the process of redesigning the hardware to reduce the amount of soldering, uh, to make some other changes, to make it easier to use and more robust, to make it smaller. Um, it's, it's sort of big right now. It's about, it's about this big. And we think we could get to about this big, which is always better when you're working with a flying vehicle. Um, so, so it is available for sale to the public, but I'm not going to put the link because I want, like, I don't want you guys to all go and buy it. Um, or if you do like, you know, really be sure you're into like a raw technical project with rough edges. Um, cool. Thank you for that. And I'm happy to take more questions, although I may not remember to check the, check the Q and A, but I did this time. So that's good. Um, I think there's a, isn't there a chat too? Yes, there's also a chat box as well. Okay. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A or chat box at any time. Awesome. Okay, um, and how do I, can you, there, okay. Um, so we talked about the human robot collaborative POMDP um, in a really general way. And almost every project in my lab fits, like I, I use that technical model to really describe everything that my lab is doing. It all fits in there somewhere. Um, but what I'm going to do next is talk about a really specific problem to kind of show how this plays out in practice. Uh, so this is a paper from my lab from a couple of years ago. And the idea is that the robot is retrieving objects for the person. So there's a bunch of objects on the table and the person is going to use language and gesture. So he'll, he'll point and he'll say, can I have that bowl? And then the robot, from that information has to figure out what object it should hand over to the person. So for this work, we assume it knows about all the objects, it knows where they are, but it doesn't know what the person wants. So here it's pretty straightforward. Um, we can basically shoot a ray out from that pointing gesture. We can use a model that knows that the word bowl maps to that object that he's pointing at. Um, and then we can maintain a belief state over what object the person is talking about. So at the beginning, before we get any information, it's uniform. We think it's equally likely they could be wanting any of these objects, but then they do their pointing gesture in the, in the language and we do a belief update and we can be really sure that it's bull number two. So that's good. But now we're gonna move the person farther away. We're gonna put the objects closer together and we're gonna reorganize them so that the bowls are right next to each other and the markers are right next to each other and the spoons are right next to each other. Now the person's gonna do the same kind of thing, say, can I have that marker and point? And what happens is we're pretty sure it's not the bowls or the spoons, but we're really not sure which marker the person's talking about. Um, they, there's no distinguishing information. So the challenge is what should the robot do now? Um, we could hand off, you know, pick a marker randomly and or one of them is probably in practice a little bit higher than the other, even though they both have significant probability. Um, but a lot of the time we'll be wrong if this model is right. Like it's really ambiguous, you know, what marker we should be handing off. What we'd like to do is to have the robot ask a question. So what we did to make this happen is we defined a model that's a simplified version of this POMDP framework where we called it the fetch POMDP. Um, we worked really hard, I forget actually what it stands for even, but we worked really hard to um, make an, an acronym that was, that was cute, fetch. Um, and what we did is use this graphical model framework, use this, this inference framework to predict how sure the robot was uh, of which object you should hand over and then decide whether or not it needed to ask a question to disambiguate what's going on. But what does let the robot do is realize that this is actually an ambiguous situation and it should ask a question and it also allows the robot to pick which question to ask. So it, in general it could ask about any of these objects but it picks the right object to ask about that reduces its uncertainty the most. 
the person says no, and we do an update to say, oh, it's the other marker. And so it can then get to a handoff. Um, and you can hand it over. Can I have that ball? But here's what it looks like. Final answer. You wanted object four. So this is the system when things are unambiguous. He's really close. He does the pointing gesture, and the robot immediately hands it over. It's one of the things I really liked about this system was how quickly the robot responds. I'll show it again because it was so fast. Can I have that ball? Final answer. You wanted object four. Then we're going to move the person farther away. And this is the same system, um, you know, doing the same stuff for language interpretation. Same thing in the back end. I have the metal object over there. This one? No, the other spoon. Final answer. You wanted object six. So here, the person's farther away. They're giving an ambiguous uh, pointing gesture. And the robot decides, oh, I'm not sure. I'd better ask a question. Uh, so the person you see in this video is David Whitney, one of my former PhD students who's graduated. Um, yay. Uh, but we also wanted to know how well this would work on people who weren't us, you know, untrained users. Um, so we had 16 participants, human participants, come in to our lab and did a within subjects design where they got to interact with the robot with three different algorithms. So the first algorithm was to never ask a question. Um, and this is kind of the state of the art for language and robotics. Um, most, most of the time, people don't think about dialogue. We just try to make our language understanding as good as we can. So in that kind of a system, you never get a disambiguating question. Um, then we tried always asking a question um, because these are the kind of template-based systems that are used a lot in uh, dialogue systems today. Um, and then last, we tried intelligently asking a question using our PomDP algorithm to intelligently decide whether or not the robot should ask a question. And we measure the speed of the interaction, so how quickly the human robot dyad is able to get to a handoff and the accuracy of the interaction. So whether the robot, when it did the handoff, was handing over the right object. Um, and what we found is that our informed method, the fetch PomDP method, is 25% faster. So it was about two seconds faster at getting to a handoff, and it was more accurate than an average of our two baselines. Um, so we were surprised. We thought that it would be less accurate than always asking a question. We thought question, asking a question isn't going to hurt you. It might take longer, but it's, it should still you know, help you be more accurate. But what we actually found is that asking questions when you didn't need to ask a question would confuse people. Like they were not expecting the robot to not understand them. And it added a chance that the robot would misunderstand the answer um, and make it go and make it become incorrect. So it's actually bad to ask a question. It reduces your accuracy as well as taking longer, um, which surprised us. Um, and what was also kind of cool is in a post study survey, 38% of our users thought the system could understand prepositional phrases, like to the left of, when the system actually couldn't. So this model, this framework, used a language model that was based on keywords that we manually defined, and it had no spatial information at all that it used. Um, but despite that, um, the interaction with language and gesture and the way that it was picking out those keywords meant that 38% of our users thought it actually understand to the left of when it couldn't. Um, so we thought that was cool because it shows the potential of these kind of interaction-based systems for um, making robots that can collaborate with people. Okay. Um, I'm checking for more questions. Cool. So that's an example of making a robot that um, interacts with people using dialogue. Um, but we also think a lot about kind of pushing the semantic complexity. Um, I bet you can see that menu. Sorry about that. Of the um, slideshow. Got concurrent slides. But if I go like that, let me see. Okay. Um, all right, so what we've been thinking a lot about is 
masking, uh, increasing the semantic complexity of the sorts of natural language commands that the robot can understand. So this comes back to this motivation of being able to understand commands at different levels of abstraction for the forklift. Um, so to think about this, we work in a simplified domain. So this is a domain we call cleanup world, where the robot is in a particular location in a grid kind of environment. Um, there's different rooms with different colors and there's objects that the robot can push around by getting behind the object and then pushing. So what we'd like to be able to do is understand really fine grain commands that a person might give like go down five, right five, one up, right four, down one, left one and up three, but also understand really abstract commands like take the red chair to the blue room. And it turns out that if you do go down five, right five, one up, right four, down one, left one, and up three, that will result in the red chair being in the green. Uh, we don't just want to have uh, low-level instructions, even though they're kind of fully general, because when we get to really complicated environments, so this is an example of a complicated environment, the International Space Station, um, it gets really, uh, it becomes a real burden to specify these really fine-grained commands. But we don't just want high-level instructions because we lose granularity. Like maybe you really do want the robot to move forward a little bit or move down and right and stop. Um, and if you only have these high-level instructions about moving objects around, you don't get the fine level of granularity um, that's here. So um, prior work in, in this problem thought about uh, language as a probability of, of predicting a reward function, a goal for the robot, given the natural language command. What we did is added a reward function and a level of abstraction. Uh, so we predicted what level of abstraction the command was at, as well as a symbolic expression representing the goal that went along with that command. We used RNNs to make this prediction. Uh, and this allowed the robot to do this understanding of natural language at different levels of abstraction. So we can go back to our POMDP and say that, like, here's a way for uh, the action space to be represented hierarchically. And then we can connect that to the language so that the robot can understand natural language commands at these different granularities. Here's Go to the red room. So here the rooms are indicated by um, the tape on the floor. So the red tape on the wall on the floor. The Go south, south, south. So here he gave a high level instruction saying go to a particular room, but he also gave a low level instruction. And the robot's able to understand both with the same system. Another sort of semantic complexity that can happen in these natural language commands is what we were calling non-Markov commands. So people like to say this all the time, things like go through the yellow room to the blue room. You know, go down Mass Ave and then turn right and then you'll be at the river. Um, where you say not only where you want the robot to be at the end, the blue room, but also constraints on how are you supposed to get there. So this is tricky because if you're in the blue room and all you know is your current state, that you're in the blue room, you have no way of knowing if you got there by going through the yellow room or some other way. Um, and so there's no way you know, going in to be able to map this to a reward function in a regular um, MDP or POMDP because we're forgetting this history. Of course, we could save all the history. We could save the robot trajectory in the state, but that ginormously increases the size of the state space, and that makes inference hard and what's already a really hard inference problem. So to understand these commands, um, what we did is introduced a formalism called linear temporal logic, LTL. And this is used a lot in the model checking and programming languages community, but also you know, more and more in the robotics community. LTL is an extension to regular logic that adds um, operators over sequences of states. So you can say finally P to mean that this predicate has to be true at the end um, of stuff. You can say globally P, which means it has to always be true. 
um, you can say next p, which means it has to be true at the next state, or p until q. So p has to be true until q is true, and then p can stop being true. Um, and then you can express more complicated goals in terms of these LTL expressions. So what we did is, um, I'm going to skip a little bit, is we used um, these LTL uh, expressions to generate, uh, essentially you can convert them to a state machine that evaluates whether the LTL expression is true. And then we can collide that state machine with the state machine of the underlying MDP or PROMDP. Um, so the specification MDP here is the state machine. You can take the LTL expression and then generate a specification MDP and then cross it with the environment MDP to get this crossed MDP. And what that does, the intuition of what that does is augment the underlying MDP to have some memory, but just enough memory to be able to evaluate this particular LTL expression. Um, so that allows us to be able to go from English or another human language to an LTL expression and then efficiently find a policy that lets the robot you know, uh, satisfy that LTL expression. So um, we would show people different natural language commands, good ones and bad ones, and we would say generate a command that would get a person to do the green thing and not do the red thing. Um, and they would say things, sometimes they would say go to the green room and they, they wouldn't really do what we wanted. Um, but other times they would say things like go to the green room, through the blue room, or go to the green room, avoiding the red room. Um, and this would map to some underlying LTL expression. Um, and we could learn a seek to seek kind of model that's able to predict uh, an Eng given a natural language command and English, given a natural language command and LTL expression, which we could then evaluate uh, to follow the command. And that enables the robot to do stuff like go through the yellow room to the blue room. And here's a video of what this looks like. Go to the blue room. So here again, the walls Blocks, so Avoid the green room and go to the blue room. The first time it went through the green room because that was. Go through the yellow room to the blue room. Sort of more direct, uh, but then he tells it to avoid the green room, so it goes through the yellow room. Now he's saying go through the yellow room, uh, and it's able to very slowly make its turn. Um, and then drive through the yellow room to the green room. Okay. Um, and then um, we've worked to combine these two ideas together. So we had a paper, which I won't talk too much about, that does both extra abstraction and um, LTL expressions at the same time. So you can give fine-grained command and abstract commands, as well as non-Markov commands. Um, and it gets more complicated, but um, so we had to do uh, some new inference algorithms to make that happen. Uh, but we did, uh, but I'll skip the details. Um, and then I'll skip this. I, I'm going actually pretty fast. Um, usually I, I have to skip a lot more, so. Um, so my lab has uh, you know, a whole bunch of sort of language and robotics papers, which you can check out on our website. Um, I've talked about a few of them here. Um, there's a piece of work that we've just, that just came out this summer that I'm super excited about. Um, so the thing about all of the learning papers that I've discussed today, is and, and really almost all existing ro robotic uh, language work is they're doing some kind of learning from a parallel data set of human language and some kind of abstract mean representation or maybe they're doing learning between a data set of human language and robot trajectories 
Um, uh, but the thing is that these data sets are really small. Uh, so our LTL data set from, from the paper that I just talked about was, uh, was like almost a thousand examples. And that was the largest data set ever of English to LTL expressions, despite LTL having been used um, in a number of different, uh, you know, have been used for a while in the community. Um, compare this to existing machine translation work in the NLP community, where they regularly use parallel data sets of human language pairs, like between French and English, or English and Chinese, or Chinese and Arabic, uh, where they have really large data sets to the tune of millions of sentences in L1, the L1 and the L2. Um, and the modern deep learning models, these seek-to-seek models, they love these large data sets and they do really weird things when you have really small data sets. Um, so what we needed was a way to scale up our data collection. Um, and we noticed that there was a similar um, sequence of uh, papers that we had observed in the robotics community in an older body of work, the GeoQuery corpus. So this is a data set of um, natural language questions about geography, so like what states border Texas, paired with formal prologue expressions of the answers. Uh, so the early papers on this topic um, required the English sentences to be annotated with parses as well as the semantic representation. Then a paper came out that said, uh, Zellmoyer and Collins, it said, oh, actually, we don't need to annotate parsons. We can learn to go from English to the formal representation without doing the whole syntax tree for every single sentence. Um, and then a paper came out in 2009 that said, actually, you know what? We don't need the logical forms, the, the logical expression at all. We can go from questions, English questions, to English answers. And we can use that to supervise a model. Um, so inspired by this, we wanted to be able to learn to go from English to LTL goal expressions without giving our model any goal expressions at training time, but only giving it examples of trajectories. And the reason is that it's actually really hard to get examples of English paired with LTL. It's, it's prohibitively difficult to train human annotators to write down LTL expression. That's kind of a non-starter. Um, what we've been doing instead is showing them an example trajectory, positive and negative examples, but we might show them a trajectory that says go through where we wanted them to say avoid the yellow room and the robot trajectory goes through the blue room to get to the red room, let's say, and, they do, and they'll say, you know, go through the blue room to get to the red room and they won't say avoid. And what that means is that the, that's a perfectly legitimate thing to say for what we're showing them. But that means that the LTL logical form that we're mapping to that sentence is wrong because they, our, our logical form was avoid and they're saying go through. So that means there should be something like next happening in the logical form. Uh, so to address this problem, we created a framework where we give the robot, instead of giving it pairs of English and LTL at training time, we give it pairs of English sentences and these trajectories um, that it would take through the environment, positive and negative examples of the trajectories. Um, and we also give it a model of LTL. So it knows um, you know, what different landmarks could be and it knows different predicates and it knows what all the LTL predicates mean, but it doesn't know what particular LTL expression goes with this natural language expression. And we use an approach called LTL progression that Basically, the system kind of hallucinates different candidate LTL expressions and then progresses them along the trajectory to see which ones correctly accept and reject the trajectories in this training set over many different examples. Um, and this was really exciting because it allows us to no longer be limited by how many pairs of English sentences with LTL expressions we can collect. Um, instead, we have a much easier data collection problem of collecting sentences paired with trajectories. Um, this was published at RSS this past summer. So it was hot off the press. Um, and I think it's a really exciting paper because it, it really opens 
uh, unblocks this bottleneck that we've had in our data collection for a long time. Okay. Um, so communication for collaboration, action for collaboration, and perception for collaboration. Um, so the last thing I'll talk about is perception for collaboration. So we think that finding objects is one of the fundamental problems in robotics. So like you might say to the robot something like, find the screwdriver, it's in the toolbox, and it's got to go figure out where it is. Um, uh, so we thought about this as like a 2D problem, find the mugs in the library, the living room, or the kitchen. Um, and then given this language, uh, we do a belief update. So here the lighter blue means it's more likely to be in those rooms and the darker blue means it's less likely. And then we defined a sensor model for the robot. So it has a fan shaped sensor model, like a typical camera field of view. Um, and it's got to drive around and figure out, you know, where if, if the object is given its detector. So here it's run its detector. It hasn't found the object. So um, it can say that, the, say that those grid cells don't have the object. But then it turns around, it runs a detector again, um, and now it's found the object. Uh, so now that it knows where the object is, it can rewrite its distribution so that um, everything else has low probability. So um, this kind of uh, inference is sort of very natural for what a POMDP should do, but it's computationally intractable to make a robot do this in the general case, especially as you add more objects and you add, make the environment larger. So we introduced a um, type of POMDP called object-oriented POMDPs, OO POMDPs, and a new algorithm, OO POMCP, which enables the robot to efficiently find a policy to carry out these search tasks. Um, so to do this sort of thing where it can drive around and decide when to run a sensor. Um, if it needs to, it can go to a different room and, and go back uh, to find the object. Uh, and to evaluate our model, what we did is compared a number of different baselines to um, our OO Palm CP. So if you look at the graph on the far uh, right, what we're doing is over the x-axis, we're changing the type of language information that we give to the robot. So for misinformed, the person says it's in the kitchen, but really it's in the living room. Uh, for no inform language information, the person says nothing. For ambiguous, the person says it's in the living room or the kitchen, I'm not sure which. And they're right, it's in one of those two rooms, but it's, but but they didn't say which room. And then for informed, the person says it's in the living room and it's in the living room. Um, and then our baselines, uh, the dark blue up at the top is sort of a fake baseline where it knows where the object is. So this is how long it would take, how much reward it gets if it just goes straight to the object when it knows where it is. Which of course is not a real problem, but it gives you an idea of an upper bound. Um, and then the lower, uh, the red on the bottom is random. This is where the robot is just driving around randomly um, and not doing anything to try to find the object. Um, and then you can see the difference between this, the, the light blue, that's OO Palm CP, and uh, regular Palm CP, which was the state of the art uh, before this paper. Um, and what you see with OO Palm CP, and here higher is better, the x-axis is reward, uh, which is given for quickly finding the right object. Um, so in the misinformed case, it doesn't do as well, but it does find the object. In the no information case, it, it does even better. In the ambiguous, when you're giving it correct but ambiguous information, it does even better. And you give it the informed case, it's almost as good as the case where it knows in advance exactly where the object is. Um, so what I really liked about this paper is that the misinformed case is like the person's lying to the robot. Like the person's telling the robot, oh, it's in the kitchen, but it's not in the kitchen. And what the robot does is goes, its belief will update, it's in the kitchen. It'll go to the kitchen, it'll look all around the kitchen and not find the object. And then we have a little smoothing term so that um, once it fails to find it in the kitchen, it'll, it'll be like, oh, it's not in the kitchen, it must be somewhere else. And then it'll go look everywhere else in the environment until it finds the correct object. So it's, it's sort of robust to, to the human line to the robot. Um, and this sort of all falls out uh, without us having to code this in as a special case. It's just what the PONDP inference does um, when we enable it to run quickly enough to find a good policy.
Um, and here's a demonstration. is It's not uh, a video. It's like slides. But like, this is our, it running on our mobile robot, our Movo. And it's using fiducials for the object detector. So it's not doing end-to-end -end object detection. Um, but here it's right, driving around the kitchen, looking for the object, sees the fiducial, runs a sensor. Oh, it's not the right object. Turns around. He's the other object. In this video. Um, and, it, and it goes. OK, so here we can see our human robot collaborative POMDP is actually factored, um, the state space, we can actually factor it in terms of objects. Um, and that's actually really important in order to carry out this inference efficiently and figure out what objects we should be paying attention to and which objects we shouldn't. Um, so I talked about communication for collaboration, action for collaboration, perception for collaboration. We started out with this really spare model of the POMDP. Um, and we kept adding more complexity to handle more facets of human language. And we're still going. Um, you know, we're, we're, my group's goal is to be able to robustly understand a human, no matter what the human says to the robot. Um, and so we're still on this path trying to make this happen. Um, so I'll finish uh, by showing another kind of I guess I was going to say off the wall, but I guess it's kind of on the wall project that we that we did. Um, I'm really lucky to work with a lot of amazing undergraduate students at Brown, um, and they sometimes come in with um, crazy project ideas I never would have thought of. So this was a project that my student Atsu Kotani did, where the robot is learning to write with a marker. So what it's doing is using its Connect camera up on the top to look at the text written in a number of different languages on the whiteboard by a person. Um, and then it's inferring a policy to produce that same text with a marker. And here the robot is drawing um, the or writing the text. Um, and this was trained on a data set of Japanese uh, katakana characters. So it never saw Chinese, it never saw English, it never saw Tamil or Yiddish or Hindi. French or Greek or Korean or Urdu. Um, so um, it is able to sort of do this deep learning. Well, it's kind of cool because uh, writing is language too, and this is sort of enabling our robot to be able to write and draw on a whiteboard or on a paper. Um, so thanks again for having me, and I'm happy to take more questions. Thank you so much, Professor Telex, uh, for the fantastic presentation. There was a question in chat. Um, is your system's performance limited by compute hardware? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it is. Um, actually, my, my group uh, is looking now into ways of dramatically upgrading our cluster at Brown because we're finding that our existing computational resources are not enough to do what we want to do um, in terms of machine learning and data mining, especially, um, I didn't talk so much about these, about these projects, but as we make robots do more complicated things, our simulation backend becomes more complicated. So we're simulating robot arms, doing pick and place tasks. Um, and that's part of the inner loop of our data generation and our training. Uh, so we, we, we definitely need more compute, uh, more CPU, more GPU. Um, Fantastic. Any other questions? Um, please use the Q&A or chat tool. Give it a minute to see if there's any other questions that pop through. There's another question I received in chat. Um, let's see, the question about learning a policy when the human lies sounds really complicated. Can you expand on that? Yeah, um, it's, what I liked about that paper is it, it, it is that we can do something that sounds really complicated with a really simple and elegant algorithm. So basically, um, I'll see if I can bounce back to that slide. Maybe here we go. Um, basically, what it's doing is reasoning about where the object is. So it basically just has a belief state, a probability distribution, um, 
that you can represent um, as one of these heat maps. So here again, light blue is more probability and dark blue is less probability. So the person says, you know, it's in the library, the living room, and the kitchen. So we do a belief update and there's belief in each of those light blue areas. So then the robot is going to ignore those other rooms and go to the, light, to the living room to start looking for the object. Uh, and if it's actually not in the living room, then it will go to the library or the kitchen, depending on which is closer, and then look in the library. And then if it's not in the library, it'll go to the kitchen. And if it's not in the kitchen, what happens is there's a little bit of residual belief in all of, I'm pointing, you can't see, I'll point with my mouse pointer. Um, and all of these other rooms that it hasn't checked yet. There's, there's just a little bit of residual belief because we don't do a, you know, a, a black and white update. We say, well, we think it's in the library, living room, or kitchen, but we're not really sh positive. So we'll, we'll leave, it could be in those other places. Um, so after it's gone and searched in those other places, it's like, I'm really sure I've looked in every single place in these rooms, it's not there. So I'm gonna go look in the other rooms now because that low probability that we left in those rooms is now greater um, than, uh, because it's gone and looked in those rooms. Thank you. A few other questions came through Q&A. I want to do a time check with you, though. Do you have a couple more minutes? Yes, yeah, I have a couple okay. more minutes. Perfect. The first question, what is the main purpose of PyDrone for PalmDP? Yeah, so, um, so PyDrone I'm doing is more for education uh, than for, uh, like, you know, running in Palm DPs. We do have one paper where we did, uh, we did put the pi, the pi drone in a Palm DP system. So that was at ICRA a couple of years ago. Bai Chuan Huang is the first author. And it was doing um, language understanding with augmented reality. So you could say stuff to, it, to the pi drone, like fly to the red box. And then you could draw the red box with augmented reality so that you could basically mark where the robot would go with AR, um, which was pretty fun. But really the main reason I'm doing the PyDrone project is, is for teaching and for outreach. Um, you know, I think it's really important to empower people with this technology. Um, you know, I was challenged by my colleague, uh, Seni Kamara, to think about, you know, what is robotics for the people? Um, and it's not just, you know, the DOD making, you know, giant scary robots. And it's not just Waymo making autonomous cars, although I do think that is an important application of robotics. And of course, it's not just factories. Um, I think one important area is, one important way to answer that question is to empower people with robots and to teach people about robots. And you can only get so far in SIM. You know, if, if we really want to increase the size and the diversity of our community, I think we really need to give students, um, young students, and a diverse set of students, physical hardware, and the tools and the infrastructure they need to play with it and to take ownership of it um, so that they can tell us what they want to do with it. Um, and, and that's what really motivates me to, with, with the drone project. Uh, so it's a, it's a stack that's based on the probabilistic robotics textbook. So it, it uses PID control, uh, unscented common filter, uh, particle filter, SLAM uh, for localization, and fast SLAM for mapping, all implemented, as I said, on board in Python as it's flying. So they can really learn these fundamental tools that all feed into stuff like PalmDPs, stuff like what Waymo is doing, stuff like what Skydio is doing, um, but in a format that's really easy to digest. Um, but it works. It flies. It does the thing. Um, mm -hmm. Great, yeah. thank you. Next question, how would this system compare to a deep learning system where the robot learned the behavior by trial and error, maybe similar to autonomous vehicles? Yeah, so we're, we do a lot of deep learning. Um, what we think, the we here is me and Michael Littman and George Konidaris at Brown. Um, what we really think is that there needs to be a symbolic intermediary between the robot and the sensing and action system and the human language system. And we think probably that symbolic intermediary language has to be, like large parts of it have to be learned. But we're not convinced that the most efficient way is to like try to learn everything. Um, so it's, it's a bet, you know, it's a bet that, you know, some stuff 
we humans learn at an evolutionary time scale and that stuff we can probably write it down pretty well um, and the stuff that I mean is things like objects you know the fact that there's objects and that objects look you know have an observation model that looks a certain way objects can act as parameters for our actions um, and the fact that um, you know, there are these logical expressions like finally and eventually, and we can learn things amongst those expressions. It's a bet that by, you know, hard coding some of that stuff and then going to try and learn different objects, learn manipulation actions that are parameterized by those objects, that by doing that, we'll be able to learn more with less training data um, than trying to learn it all end to end. Um, the, th the thing about learning it all end to end is that like it's really expensive to collect data on a real physical hardware platform like it's really really expensive to do because robots are expensive and robots don't move very fast if they do move fast you're scared so you don't generally move them very fast um, and they break you know especially if you're moving them a lot which is what you're doing when you're trying to collect data um, so so our our you know our bet is that by providing more structure for the learning, we'll be able to learn more with less data. Um, but I say it's a bet. It's not a thing, you know, I'm glad Sergey is out there, Sergey Levine is out there trying to do end-to-end -end learning. You know, I'm glad somebody's trying that. Um, and I, you know, I just think that the answer is somewhere in the middle. Great, thank you. And last question, how does the robot know the query is ambiguous enough to ask more questions and it doesn't have enough information to process the query on its own? Yeah, so we basically define a reward function that um, this is for like the fetch pom DP, where it gets reward for handing the right object to the person quickly. Um, and it gets negative reward for handing the wrong object to the person. So what that says, it, so then when it's running its inference, it's basically doing a calculation about the expected benefit of asking the question and being more confident, um, but taking longer versus not asking the question and not being more confident, but taking less time. Uh, and when you do that calculation, like it, it's, it's basically thinking about like, if I ask this question, what's gonna happen next? Um, what's my expected reward under my distribution of, I think it's this object with this probability, and I think it's that object with this probability. And based on that, it, it, decide, it makes a call about whether or not to ask a question. So what this opens the door to is something I call reward hacking. Um, you can control how likely it is to, or you know, how much it asks questions by tweaking that reward function. So you can make it really expensive to take us, you know, to hand over the wrong object and really cheap to ask a question. And then it'll ask, you know, to take one extra step. And then it'll ask more questions or you can make it really expensive to hand over the wrong or really cheap to hand over the wrong out no big deal and really expensive to bother the person with a question and it'll never ask a question um, in practice we tuned it by hand somewhere in the middle to something we thought made sense to us um, and if such a system was fielded probably what makes sense is to is to try to learn that parameter within some bounds but to say you know some people have different and for some applications there's different risk tolerances um, and sometimes it's good to try to ask a question sometimes it's not and some people really never want to be bothered they'd rather just have a guess and other people um, don't